Good evening and welcome to tonight's edition of Resistance TV. I'm delighted to welcome Matt Kennard, who will be speaking to us tonight about the influence of the British establishment on democracy in this country, particularly the influence it has over the Labour Party, which is really interesting given that many people, and me included when I first joined the Labour Party back in the mid-1970s, always saw the Labour Party as a anti-establishment party. So it'd be interesting to get Mark's thoughts about that. Mark, uh, Matt is a, uh, a, a, a journalist, an independent journalist, who's a co-founder of Declassified and the author of a uh, really interesting book, Irregular Army and the Racket. It's about how the US military recruited neo-Nazis, white supremacists and criminals to fight the war on terror. But first of all, I wanted uh, Matt to speak about uh, some articles that he's recently written about the role of GCHQ and how it's been infiltrating uh, schools in this country. So, Matt, could you perhaps uh, kick us off with that and then we'll, we'll move on to the issues relating to the Labour Party? Uh, sure. Um, so we uh, last week published a series of three stories about GCHQ, which is the largest intelligence agency in the UK. Um, it's a signals intelligence agency, which effectively means it's a surveillance um, agency which collects uh, communications data from all over the world, but also, as Edward Snowden revealed, um, within the UK itself. And I had heard about a schools program that they were running in Gloucestershire, which is uh, the county where the, the agency is based in Cheltenham. Um, and there was very little information about it. So I was going on the official website um and then got a few leads and tried to get more information from the from GCHQ and the National Cyber Security Center which is kind of the arm that runs it it's kind of a front effectively it was opened in 2016 to have a sort of more soft image than GCHQ um so they ran their schools program through the NCSC um and I soon found out that you can't get any information about the program um because they block freedom of information requests because it's a, a, on national security grounds. You can't you can't use that those laws to get information from MI5, MI6, or GCHQ. Um, then I went to the schools themselves and tried to get information from the schools, which are obviously public bodies. And again, I had an IT teacher block a, a, requ a request about basic information, i.e., things like have GCHQ officers been in the school. Um, what, what what the programs involve? How much do they cost? How 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 often do they run? Really basic things that you would think any school would have to give up, and that was blocked by the IT teacher in the school on national security grounds. So you have a, an IT teacher who's teaching kids as young as eleven, who's who's raising national security concerns to block information requests. So obviously at that point my interest was piqued, um, and I thought, well, I have to find out more information about it. And then I managed to get access to. Well, seven or eight months of newsletters which were produced by GCHQ, which kind of, which were more celebrating the program, but were kind of for private eyes only, but really explained uh, what, what was happening. Um, and it was quite revelatory, really. The, the, the first story we did was based on uh, entries into this newsletter, which effectively showed, I mean, it, it's not cast iron, but it looked like, the GCHQ were using the program to spy on kids. So, for example, there was one school in Hereford, which is actually outside the area that the program was meant to be operating in. But there was this, there was a, a what was what was called a very talented child who the school were worried about um, might move into uh, criminal activities online. He hadn't done anything wrong, but they they were worried about it because he was particularly talented. And GCHQ through the NCSC organised what they called a joint tag team event at the school, which emulated. Um, other programs, other events that they'd run, but was specifically designed to gain access to this child, who at that point, and I don't think probably knows now, that that event was completely created to gain access to him. So, I mean, really outrageous things like that. And then the, on top of that, it, the, this newsletter revealed the extent of arms companies that were involved in the program penetrating schools. So you have uh, companies like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, BAE systems going into secondary schools and primary schools. So there was Raytheon ran a junior a junior cyber day 
um, at a local primary school. This is obviously with kids ranging from four to 11. And Lockheed Martin, um, and this was celebrated, if you read the newsletter, the language is sort of celebrating this fact. Lockheed Martin were, were part of, and Raytheon as well, were part of what were called speed dating sessions with 12-year-old girls. Um, I mean, a, a really obscene stuff. And this isn't, I, I don't know what what people think like in this world but it wasn't it wasn't they weren't saying saying this in a way that was bad so we we did we did that revelation and then one of the companies involved which was particularly interesting was called Cybersecurity associates and i looked into them a bit because they were they, they were probably the most involved company of all and they're quite small found out that actually they, it was a company that was created by the commander of the uk military's uh, cyber warfare unit which is housed within gchq he left in 2000, um, I think 2013, uh, and then created this company. Um, and now that company is creating all sorts of tools which are being used by kids, including how to hack, how to hack passwords, how to launch brute force cyber attacks. And these are all materials that are, that are being disseminated throughout Gloucestershire and actually throughout the country because the UK government wants to roll this out. Um, I mean, just reading the newsletter and writing those stories, it was uh, it really created a, a sort of anger to, to see what they were doing. But this is a pro this is a program that that was not has not been covered at all by the mainstream media. They're not interested, yeah. which is mad. I mean, when we published it, we thought it might get picked up in the mainstream. Yeah, nothing, uh, and that tells you something about the the, the way the way that the discourse in this country. Um, supports the security yeah. state and how they manage to get away with what they get away with because even when salient information which you would have thought would worry all parents in the country because as I said this is a, a program the UK government wants to roll out yeah. there's no interest so people don't know um, I uh, and actually I, make, make that point Matt. I mean funnily enough actually next week next Thursday uh, we are doing a, uh, a session on Resistance TV where we're talking about freedom of speech and challenging manufactured consent and uh, I think what we're seeing here, what you're describing there, is very much part of this whole process of manufacturing consent, isn't it? A hundred percent. Because people have a completely distorted view of Britain's role in the world, but also the, the government's own uh, operations that it runs on its own population, because they're not covered. If that had been about Russia, for example, which is the enemy du jour, mm. you would have seen it on in every newspaper the head of the GR, the, the head of the cyber warfare unit in the GRU is teaching Russian school kids how to launch cyber attacks. Can you imagine? Be, it, it would be a huge story. Not but, but 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 literally not one write up in the in the in the media here. Um, so apart from I think the Canary. So that that in in that context, the discourse being created uh, effectively by the security services because the enemies that they pick are then are the ones that the media um, echoes. Uh, you have a completely distorted view of our role in the world. And, and uh, in my opinion, um, alternative media is the only way to, to deal with that because you, these are unreformable institutions. They're not only bad, they're designed to be bad because they're designed to misinform the public because the reality is the establishment wants to protect itself. And they know that if the public knows what it's doing, it won't be able to go on, which is why these statues falling is amazing because that's a major kind of attack on these these figures again that have been venerated by the establishment and echoed by their ideological organs and 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 suddenly they're all falling down and people are discussing why why are these why were these people put up in the first place what is our establishment about what is our history yeah. um so it's, it's an interesting time but i think and partly why we set up declassified um is because we wanted to become part of that alternative media ecosystem because at this stage um with the crisis in the world, we cannot rely on the mainstream media to inform the public. Um, and I mean, we can talk about this in relation to the Starmer story that I did recently oh, as well, yeah. again, not picked up at well, all. Yeah, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come on to that in, in a moment, <clears throat> certainly. But of course, one of the tactics which is often used is to try and dismiss stories like this as, as fake news. And I don't know whether you've experienced that as a, as a tactic that's been deployed against the uh, output that, that Declassified has been uh, uh, putting into the public domain. Some yeah, experts. it's interesting yeah. because I think there's how the narrative is maintained. Yeah, there's, two, there's two main tactics. One is the institutions which are effectively establishment outlets like the Times, the Guardian, the Telegraph, they are seen as the, they have the good reputation. If you read stuff from them, most people think, oh, that must be true. 
Uh, so they, uh, but in fact, they're completely captured organisations. And then the alternative media ones, a lot of resources go into destroying their reputation. So although the counter narratives are put out there by the alternative media, their reputations are so badly damaged by establishment attacks that people don't take the information that they that they put out seriously. And obviously, they make mistakes sometimes. Everyone does. But those mistakes are amplified massively and it becomes, oh, you can't trust them anymore sort of thing. So it's a quite a beautiful system that they operate where the only trusted information is, in fact, establishment propaganda. Now, the classified, we haven't really come up against it because we've gone out of our way from the start, and this is a big part of our mission, is to make sure everything is completely uh, sourced, rigorously uh, edited, rigorously fact-checked. Not every single comma, full stop is, we, we go over it with a fine tooth comb. And you have to because um, because there's a lot of people that want to attack you uh, yes. in the establishment and other interests. But what's interesting is because we do that, so there's less way that they can attack us on that stuff, we're just ignored. So they don't even put that because that's also an effective way of marginalising oh, indeed, Of course, yes, indeed. So uh, We haven't really been attacked as fake news because it's, it's harder because we've gone out of our way to do that. But the, the, the tactic they've used is just ignore it. It doesn't exist. Yeah, that's that's the other, that's the other side of the coin. That's the other tactic which is deployed, isn't it? Gets fake yeah. news or, or just don't give it a platform. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, and starve it, it that way. I mean, when I was uh, in Parliament, as you uh, know, Matt, I was asking some questions about the Integrity Initiative and the Institute for Statecraft. And one of the interesting revelations uh, that I discovered of some of the people behind that organisation is that they were very keen to create, a, if you like, a militarised sort of mindset in the in the in the population at large. And they were uh, very unhappy about the proportion of spending that was going into public services. And they wanted to sort of flip that and, and see more resources effectively, I suppose, supporting the military industrial complex. And when you consider the uh, the paucity of, uh, of our public services after 10 years or so of, of austerity, I mean, it's a, it's a very odd uh, mindset to to hold, but uh, clearly uh, they are an influential organisation that have had uh, substantial sums of money uh, from the public purse, and then we've got agencies like GCHQ that you've talked about. I mean, these are it's very worrying, isn't it, that, that this sort of thing is going on? It's being funded in that way, and the impact that it has on our sort of democratic structures in society. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think it's all around getting bigger budgets, um, feeding into the private sector as well, because they've got a lot of. Public, uh, private sector contracts so there's a pressure there to monetize these threats and I think that one of the really interesting thing about COVID-19 has been that we've seen that our defense and security organizations that's a misnomer they're not set up to defend us there's I mean a percentage of it is about terrorism but a lot of it is about uh, commercial interests uh, for example, MI6 uh, are involved with with big com oil companies around the world, uh, infamously. GCHQ does commercial espionage, um, and they the MI5, did, uh, as far as we know, didn't even have a desk that dealt with biosecurity. And even though the government's uh, national risk register had flagged a pandemic as a major threat for for many years, amongst Britain's biggest threat, they've done nothing on climate change, which the UK government has said is a security threat right here, right now. And obviously we know it is. So these are these are institutions that are completely, the perception of them is completely warped. And one of the most worrying things we saw with the GCHQ investigation was GCHQ is using their schools program to disseminate uh, propaganda about what they do. So there was a slide, a downloadable lesson plan that I looked at where a slide in it which was actually an unattributed quote to the director of GCHQ, Jeremy Fleming, yeah. um, said, we have been at the heart of Britain's security for 100 years. Um, we've done countless wonderful things. But in fact, if you look at, I mean, most of the information we can we know about GCHQ is from the Snowden leaks in 2013, but there's they are up to all sorts of skullduggery that is not about protecting us. Um, it's about protecting a particular part of the establishment and it's about protecting business interests as well. And it's about uh, taking on targets of the establishment. For example, JTRIG, I don't know if you've heard of this uh, unit within, a cyber war warfare unit within um, GCHQ, which was exposed by uh, Snowden. And there's a slide that we saw which says that they're involved in honey traps, um, false flag operations, which is posing as an enemy, all sorts of um, uh, offensive operations. 
And GTHQ are telling kids, we're all about defense. We're all about defending. But in fact, they're a major part of the war state. And, and GCHQ has stations in Cyprus, in Oman. They're an offensive agency, a lot of what they do. So it's definitely a hugely worrying thing, the militarization and securitization of, of our society. I mean, the next stage of the militarization and uh, securitization of our schools is even more worrying because if you get kids that young, it's very hard to break out if you've been conditioned. And we're talking about primary schools, as I said, arms companies that are involved in war crimes around the world uh, te uh, teaching kids in schools with kids as young as four. I mean, that's really that's really quite a worrying development. And uh, and Lockheed Martin, uh, who was were doing who were doing speed dating with twelve year old girls, they produced the Mark eighty two bomb, which blew up forty school children on a bus in Yemen in two thousand and eighteen. I mean, that that's not talked about. But how sick is that that you've got this company which is involved in blowing up kids halfway across the world? Um, doing speed dating with British children. Um, so I, I find it hugely worrying uh, what's happening. And I think that it is a, a trend you see around the world uh, because the economic system has created such inequality, such divisiveness. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fallout of that is a, is, a, is a lot of anger, a lot of poverty, which creates all sorts of societal problems. And the establishment and the people that do benefit from the system need to protect themselves from a society which is decaying. So you see this militarization and securitization around the world. Um, we need to fight it, but it's, it's hard to know how because your your adversaries, and especially here, are just so powerful. Indeed. Uh, and they have the media on their side. They certainly do. And uh, I mean, one of the things that to, I'm always been banging on about and one of the reasons why we're trying to build a new grassroots movement is to demonstrate that we can only defeat these very powerful forces in society if we stand together in solidarity. I mean, obviously, there are a lot more of us than them, mm -hmm. um, but it's about mobilising and motivating people. And, and it's been really encouraging to see the outpouring of support that there has been in this country and around the world for the Black Lives Matter campaign. And I mean, I attended a rally in Derby at the weekend. It's the biggest rally we've ever seen in Derby. And it wasn't organised by the traditional Labour movement. In fact, there were no visible signs of the labor movement being in attendance there and so i think you know there is a uh, burgeoning uh, movement there and i think it's really important if we if that can be harnessed and mobilized and that really can be a, a substantial force for change but just in terms of some of the excellent work that you've been uh, and your organization you know, declassified has been has been doing uh, matt what kind of response have you been receiving uh, for example to your latest revelations uh, and the other work that you uh, and your colleagues have been doing from parliamentarians. I mean, have you had any interest, any sort of questions being asked by parliamentarians in view of what you... We have a few. We've had a few. We had a question. I can't remember the name of the MP, but we, we did a story early on um, about... Uh, <laughs> again, this is a story that you would think would, would, would have some mainstream traction, but it was about a, a, a British military unit, which is embedded... In the Saudi um, Sang, which is the the personal protection force of the uh, royal family, um, and we revealed that they are effectively commanded by the Saudis. So we have a, a UK military unit which is commanded by the Saudis, which is outra uh, outrageous and also takes on a, a new sort of dimension when you consider what what is happening in Yemen legally, even. Um, we had a question that was that was asked about that in Parliament, but generally no. Um, there are, I mean, Labour does have so, uh, there's four or five MPs who are who are quite decent on sort of this foreign policy stuff, but that's it. In a parliament of like hundreds and hundreds of MPs, uh, no one no one takes this up. And in fact, I think that the, the the political system is captured in the same way that the media is. And I mean, you saw that what what happened to you. Um, if you step out, if you step on these red lines, you get taken out. There's no messing around. <laughs> That's how the system works. You cannot, you, it protects itself. And the media system works like that. The political system works like that. Academia works like that. Any, any institution which has a, a grip on public perceptions is tightly controlled. Um, and if you step out of line, you, you, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get attacked and you, you might get ruined. So um, – the, the, the political reaction has again hasn't been uh, hasn't been hasn't been big. No, I mean, I'm but, a, go on, sorry. Sorry, go on, no, carry on. No, I was going to say, but we, we we keep plugging away. You know, I mean, this information we see it as a a store of good, rigorous information about a whole area of the of the British state that just is not known about. 
So yes. it's there for anyone who needs to see it and re researchers and students and, and people. Through, and it's not going away. So we just... Well, I'm, I'm hopeful, um, you know, the eternal optimist, I suppose you have to be as a socialist, that mm. the advent of new media uh, and um, you know, publications like yours does give us a, a chance of... Of exposing some of this stuff. I mean, and I think one of the reasons why the Black Lives Matter uh, campaign has, has managed to obtain such traction is this sense of citizen uh, citizen journalism. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, we had uh, uh, Mark Wadsworth on the program last night, and he was talking about this uh, and the fact that you know people have got their smartphones and so on, and we, we can capture some of this stuff now in a way that wasn't possible in the past and then with the advent of declassified the canary and various other online publications i'm i'm like the word is another uh, publication which has recently been launched a left uh, newspaper which is public publishing weekly at the moment and they're hoping to go daily at some point we have the morning star of course but yep. it's the only daily paper which never seems to get any review on the uh, on the mainstream media is it you know yep. i mean the, the, we, we you know sky news do the kind of what the papers uh, saying tomorrow at bbc do the same yeah. They, all, they have a whole program devoted to it, but they never mention what the Morning Star is saying, yeah. you know. And they've obviously got a lot of good th and important things to, to say. Yeah. Uh, so we've got to, you know, build our own media. And this was one of the things, I think, when Jeremy Corbyn was the leader of the party and there was so many attacks against him, um, a lot of activists were saying, we are his media and we, we, we have to continue with that, it, it seems to, to me. But yeah. um, I, I wonder if we can maybe move on now to... Uh, Keir Starmer, who, Sir Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, who you recently wrote an open letter to and, uh, and fleshed that out uh, in, in an article. And I just perhaps want to begin with your questions about his links to the security services, uh, MI5, in his meeting with MI5 officials. What was that all about? Well, it's interesting. So I, I didn't know much about Keir Starmer. So when he was elected leader, um, I wanted to find out more and looked at, he was director of public prosecutions at the CPS from 2008 to 2013. And it's a public body. So there's actually uh, quite a lot of records uh, from the time when he was DPP. So I started looking through them to see what he was up to and who he was meeting with and blah, blah, blah. And I just, one of them just had this, uh, completely uh, out of nowhere had this meeting with Sir Jonathan Evans, who at the time was the head, the director general of MI5, the domestic security service of the, of the UK. Now the context of that, um, and this was a social uh, drink because there's another register where you register official meetings with outside organizations, which is where he would have put it. If this was a, a meeting with MI5 for, I don't know, some, some kind of uh, work-related um, thing. This was a social meet, uh, meeting. The, f the other thing is this was paid for by Evans because it was hospitality register. Mm -hmm. So you only put it down if someone buys you something, which struck me as weird because you would think that he would just pay for his own drink so he didn't have to put it down. But anyway, it's down there. Um, the context is that he, as DPP, and his record on who he prosecuted and <laughs> who he didn't at that time is, is quite interesting and people should look into it. But he, one of the cases which is particularly interesting is um, a UK resident called Binya Mohammed who was snatched in 2002 by the CIA and then tortured with MI5 complicity uh, and there was a one MI5 officer called uh, Witness B who who was investigated and Keir Starmer as DPP had the final say on whether he was prosecuted he said no in 2010 despite quite a lot of evidence and then uh, the investigation was expanded into um, MI6 and some event, uh, alleged alleged torture at Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan uh, in 2002. And that, again, after 30 months of investigation, was thrown out. There was no prosecution. A he's year back. after that. Well, yeah, he's back. Back. And then Jonathan Evans greeted uh, Starmer's decision with elation. He said, we're very, very glad, MI5, that they had, they, they ruined, they, Witness B's life's been ruined, but we're very glad CPS made the right decision. So there was obviously quite a, a cosy, uh, well, a feeling of uh, elation from Evans at, at Starmer's decision. Then in 2013, they have this social drinks. We don't know what was talked about or why. Um, Starmer then you leaves. asked him, haven't you, uh, what, what they did talk about? And I suppose you've had a response. No, I had no response. I asked Evans as well, no response. <clears throat> so, um, and then he, Starmer then leaves 
the CPS a week later. Oh no, Evans then leaves MI5 a week later and then a week after that, Starmer announces he's going to leave the CPS, which he does later that year. Uh, Evans is now a lord after being appointed a life peer by Cameron and Starmer, we know yeah. what happened with him. So yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. And it, it his record as DPP is... It, is is interesting as well because he not only did he allow um uh the MI, this MI five officer to get off scot free uh, and there were no and this MI six officer and there were no prosecutions of any security services despite them quite uh, there was quite a lot of evidence if you look into it there were telegrams etc that showed that MI five knew what was happening and were providing information nothing happened Evans himself at the time was head of the counter terrorism unit um at MI five um and then. In 2009, um, uh, Keir Starmer had come out supporting a super database which collected all the calls and all the emails sent in Britain, which yeah. was uh, an outrageous uh, attack on civil liberties. So so you have that. And then, um, obviously, he was there during the Assange case. Uh, yeah. I mean, just yeah. before we come on to the Assange yeah. case, I wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about... Um, his involvement with the Trilateral Commission. He's a, he's a member of the Trilateral Commission. I mean, this is a curious backstory for a leader of uh, what, as I said at the outset, a political party that many people regard as an anti-establishment party. It certainly was established in the first instance, I think, as an anti-establishment party. And definitely when Jeremy Corbyn was elected as the leader, I think many people saw it as, as such. Could you say a bit about that? And perhaps you could maybe unpack a bit more about what the Trilateral Commission is. Sure. So I, I've i heard about it on and off over the years, and there is a lot of conspiracy about what it is, like with all these things like Bilderberg Group. But in fact, if you look into it, it is a, it is a, it's an established organisation, establishment organisation, which is linked heavily to the intelligence community. It was founded in 1973 by the billionaire David Rockefeller, who was at that time a chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, and um, he he had, well, I looked at the declassified files and he had close links to the CIA. There's files which show him arranging meetings with the head of the director of the CIA in the 80s and earlier. So around the period when the Trilateral Commission was really taking off. It's, it calls itself a fora for, international, for influential people around the world, um, in Japan, Europe, and America, basically. It's seen as like, a, it's, an, it's an imperialist alliance. It's trying to maintain the power of those of, of the West against interlopers like uh, China or Russia or whatever it is in the day. So that's what they call themselves. But if you look into it, they're heavily linked with intelligence. I looked at the, you can't get in, all their records are 100% off the, off the record. But you can get so you, you can get some registers of what the talks were, and there's a talk in 2017 which was chaired by uh, the former head of MI5 in uh, and the former head of GCHQ. There's a they had a plenary meeting in Singapore which was uh, John Scarlett spoke at, who's the former head of MI6. So it's it's heavily linked to the intelligence world, or at least they have significant access to the world of intelligence. Starmer is the only serving British MP who is a member. So and he's never talked about he's never talked about his membership of it at all. So we don't know what he's what oh, I saw that he attended one meeting. He was in one of these registers, but apart from that, we know nothing about what he. Was there anything in the mainstream uh, media about his membership of the Trilateral Commission? Nothing. Anyway. Nothing. It's like it's like Harold Pinter said uh, in his Nobel Prize winning speech. If it's yeah. about uh, well, he was talking about U.S. imperialism, but he said, yeah. but you can you can you can use it for for the establishment here. If it's the UK establishment. And it's something that they've done. It doesn't exist. It's, no. it's, it, it, it just didn't happen. So there's been no talk about it. There was, there has been some chatter on alternative media about it. But yes. as I said, a lot of it is quite conspiracy tinged. And in fact, it's yeah. it's good to pin it down because with the Trilateral mm -hmm. Commission, you can. There's 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 there is some information out there. Um, and there's again, an interesting, uh, there's an interesting short video that Noam Chomsky did. If you've seen that, yeah. He talked about the origins of the Trilateral Commission, and uh, one of the things they were concerned about was an excess of democracy in the 1960s. If you exactly. Well, and as you say, regardless of whether you think this is an intelligence front or whatever, there are some conspiracy theories about it. As you say, it, as someone who is a leader of the Labour Party, it's definitely an establishment organisation. It's It's got huge access to the establishment across the Western world. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a club for establishment politicians, establishment businessmen, 
and women establishment academics it's just a it's a it's a club for the establishment so someone who has who's leading the labor party should have nothing to do with it do we but know any other parliamentarians i know you're saying that <clears throat> the clear is the only serving um, parliamentarian i mean have there been other parliamentarians in the past i mean yeah. how many british parliamentarians uh, there's been a number uh, there, there was uh, i saw on a list which is quite interesting that the one of the they had a list of former members that are now in public service so they're not members anymore but uh, and have left, but are now in, uh, MPs. One of which was, or the only British one, was Rory Stewart. Yes, uh, Tory MP. Uh, yeah, yeah, Tory MP, who obviously, who is, uh, who the Telegraph, a security source, a Whitehall security source, told the Telegraph was an MI6 officer before he entered politics. So, and there's Lord Kerr, who's a former ambassador to the US. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Starmer's the only, the only, uh, uh, only current serving member. Very, very, uh, very interesting. And just going on to some of the other points that you uh, raised in your open letter to Starmer, uh, you also asked about his uh, trip uh, when he was DPP to see uh, Eric uh, Holder, the former US uh, Attorney General. I think that was in 2011, where he, he took a first class flight, did he, uh, mm. to the States to, to see him? What, what was that about? Or you've got any well, we don't know. investigations? And again, this is something that should have been reported on by the press because he, the the, the behaviour of the CPS uh, with the Assange case was completely outrageous. Um, and we know for a fact that they're trying to hide information because it came out that they deleted emails while Starmer was DPP about the case. There's an Italian journalist called Stefania Marisi who's been in a protracted legal um, fight to get information on the case, even basic information, and the CPS won't give it up. And it's obviously they're trying to hide something. Um, the, the, the information that has come out has shown quite clearly that the CPS were advising the Swedes not to come to London to interview Assange. This is during the Swedish um, allegations of uh, sexual assault. Um, and if they'd come at that point in 2010 11, the embassy standoff wouldn't have happened. So, I mean, Something was definitely happening at the CPS, which was highly irregular. Um, Keir Starmer's never been talked about his role in it, but obviously as DPP, he would have, it was a very prominent case. He would have been uh, at least briefed on what was happening. And then I saw there's US government files um, from 2011, which, which outlined the itinerary of uh, Eric Holder, the Attorney General at the time. Um, and one of them was a meeting with Starmer in November 2011, during which we don't know what they talked about, but there were the UK uh, liaison prosecutor uh, to the US, Gary Balk, was in the room. Uh, you would imagine that Assange was discussed um, the year before uh, Holder had said that he had started unspecified um, legal processes uh, against Assange and WikiLeaks. So, so you would imagine that something was going on there. He went back to Washington in 2012 and 2013 uh, we have no idea what what he was doing in those uh, uh, trips, but but he might have been meet, meeting Holder again, and it might have been Assange related. But he should. I mean, this is a major. There's a lot of things to analyse about what happened, what he did when he was DPP. But the Assange case is one of the is a really outrageous, um, uh, a litany of uh, outrageous behaviour from the CPS. Um, which is and, and the fact that it's, they're quite clearly trying to cover up for something is it should be a signpost to a lot of people. Have you tr sought the assistance of any uh, parliamentarians to try to get to the bottom of uh, his role as DPP and what and what he did? I mean, whether that's a potential route, asking parliamentary <laughs> questions uh, of his role during that time. I mean, exactly. if, you can if you can think of an MP that would do it for us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can. I have sent some freedom of information requests to the CPS because, as, as I said, it's a public body, so there is a degree of transparency that they have to... But looking at what Marisi came up against uh, in her legal process, the idea that you get something from them is, is kind of far-fetched, to be honest with you. But um, it would be quite interesting to see journalists ask him in the press conference I mean, he's he's completely protected. It's like I say, all the salient issues are just ignored, and we we focus on tittle tattle. But the um, but these all these questions that I outlined in the open letter should be responded to, Very really. Much. Very much. So. I mean, these are the sort of questions that you'd expect, uh, you know, the mainstream journalists to be asking, um, because these are a matter of public interest. I mean, if this isn't a matter of public interest, I don't know. 
what is. And uh, I mean, had I still been a parliamentarian and not been forced out, that you can rest assured I would have been raising this on the floor of the House of Commons. And at least we've been able to get it onto the public record in that way. And uh, it is quite scary in a way, you know, that uh, the uh, establishment seems to have this hold over parliamentarians on both sides of the chamber, isn't it? I mean, why aren't, why aren't we seeing more MPs uh, making a, a stink about some of these issues, particularly Julian Assange uh, and the, his, I mean, look, the guy's a political prisoner. It's absolutely outrageous that he's being incarcerated in the way that he that he has been. And uh, it, it, it seems to me that, that Britain is, is once again proving to be the poodle of the United States, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. And, and I agree with you. I think it's one of the most important issues of the day, because if they set the precedent and they get Assange, uh, then it, in, it imperils all journalists, that, especially who are doing national security reporting, but effectively doing any kind of reporting, which is critical of the U US state, because it gives them extra territorial reach. They can go around the world and just say, well, we don't like that journalist, um, what they revealed about our, what we do. Bring him in. Let's put him in a supermax for the rest of their life. It's a, what do you think this is about them? Uh, because, uh, look, to me, I think journalism it should be an honourable profession. What you're doing at Declassified is incredibly honourable. It's kind of rehabilitating the reputation of, of journalism. But I would have thought that most people go into journalism for very you know, high-minded sort of moralistic reasons, really. They want to kind of, you know, report on what's right. And uh, I'm sure they see people like John Pilger and so on and the role that, you know, that, that he's played in the past and, and you know, newspapers that are like you know, the Times and not exactly a friendly paper, but, you know, they, they revelations about thalidomide and so on going back a long, long time. Yeah. What's happening? Oh. I mean, look, you know, it's a bizarre, well, it's a bizarre well, thing well, that happened. So silent, these characters. Well, we've had a time, we've had a democratization of the media, which has coincided with the actual legacy media, mainstream media, getting worse, which I can't really, I can't understand. To me, that seems like a contradiction. You would, you would think if with the advent of blogs and alternative media sites, they'd have to open up a bit, but in fact, they've got much more uh, constrained and much, you can say a lot less within the mainstream, which is a bizarre thing for me. But I think that what it is, is the, me the, the media is a massive, uh, an independent and critical media that does its job of holding power to account is obviously a massive threat to power. So power has, I think especially since the, the war in Iraq, has really gone after and yeah. media and tried to capture uh, mainstream media and, and, and stop it being a threat. Because, and, and in fact, the first story we did at Declassified was about how this, what the security services have done to the Guardian newspaper in the wake of Snowden. Because obviously Snowden is kind of the emblematic case of where uh, really courageous journalism exposed and whistleblowing exposed uh, awful uh, surveillance of the whole world and, 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 and told us stories that, every, that impacted every human being on earth. And the security services knew that that's a massive threat to them. And what they want is they, want a, they don't want a mainstream media that has reach and has resources that will accept leaks like that and cover them. So they were, and in fact, the rest of the media wouldn't have done it. You wouldn't see like the Telegraph or the Times if Snowden had come to them. They probably would have shocked him to the authorities. But the Guardian at that stage was still relatively independent, so that posed a big threat to the security services. And they went off to the Guardian. They did a they did a number on them. Basically, you can you can see it. They put their deputy editor on a notice committee. They gave the first ever exclusive interview of a sitting head of MI5 mm. to one of their journalists the following year. They gave the, an exclusive into the head of MI6. You can see, you, if you delineate the kind of charm offensive that they did, and now you see the Guardian is kind of a, a, a desiccated uh, shadow of its former self. And I think that's that's what you see, that the, the, the power has has managed to co-opt main, the mainstream. And I think you're right. And there are some good journalists still working in the mainstream, of course. The problem is, if you're a young journalist coming up now, that, yes, there are alternative media outlets, but if you want to have a career, you want to have a job that pays okay, you want to get a mortgage, you want to have a family, yeah. like you, you, there's not many spaces out there for you. In fact, I left journalism school. I mean, I, I, politically, I was the same as I, I am now, but um, I went and worked for the FT. Not that I wanted to, but there was I worked for, uh, worked as an intern for Democracy Now!, but I was unpaid and I couldn't do it for very long. Then I was came back to London and I thought, well, where do I go? I, got, I want to get a job. And there was nowhere. So what, will, what I think the really powerful thing that will change the game 
is that we can create an alternative media infrastructure that allows people to live a normal life and yeah. write in independent outlets. At the moment, we're not quite there yet. We're getting there, but the, but that will really change the game because now people kind of have to enter the system if they want to have a normal life and have to sell their, their kind of, not sell their souls because obviously some good journalism still happens, but they have to kind of shave off their, their edges and become part of the system. So I, I, I think it's having an impact on so-called representative democracy because the representatives in parliament don't seem to be representing the people. Um, very little protest has been raised about, for example, Julian Assange's treatment. There's been a silence on the issues that you've talked about in terms of GCHQ, for example, this evening. And uh, I wonder if the, and what your thoughts are about the uh, impact of the direction of travel of the media, uh, whether that's having an effect on, on democracy, on parliamentarians and their, and their willingness to, to speak out, or indeed the willingness of people to put themselves forward as uh, representatives in the first place. Well, <laughs> I think um, I think you are one of the examples of what happens to someone who steps out of line, and these you stepped out of line on media created narratives. So of course it has an impact on Parliament because all the narratives that you were kind of um, on Assange on the uh, quote unquote anti semitism crisis in Labour, all the all of those things were media created narratives. Obviously there there were elements within the political system that were pushing them out, but the 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 the, the people that were disseminating to society at large and making them an issue was the media. So in my opinion, I think the, if we're going to free ourselves from this unjust, uh, racist, in an unequal society that we live in, we, the media has to, be, has to be completely reformed. That, to me, is the biggest obstacle of, of, of progressive change. Because well, it Jeremy, creates... to be fair, Jer Jeremy talked about um, significant reforms in the media, didn't he, uh, when he made that speech at the... Um... Edinburgh Fringe uh, in 2018. They talked about democratising the media and implementing Leveson 1 and embarking on Leveson 2. I suspect that was another <laughs> reason why he had a, an even bigger target uh, uh, on his back uh, in terms yeah. of the smears to which he was uh, subjected. But is that the, the what we need, really? It's, 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 it's change on that magnitude to try and bring our media you know, make it fit for purpose in that sense. Yeah, we need to. I, I would say we need a completely new media. I mean, I don't, I don't think that it's, I don't think it's reformable. I think we just, m my position on it now, and I, I wasn't always like this, but I've come to the position where I think journalists, especially ones that can do, should boycott the mainstream media because mm -hmm. they are the problem. So why give them your time? Why give them your work? Why give them your resources? Build something better outside. But it's a long, it's a long-term project, but it has to happen. And this is what kind of annoyed me with the Corbyn project, especially Corbyn and and John McDonnell. They would. They, they were under sustained attack from The Guardian, for example, for four years, right? Uh, they, they were one of the major progenitors of the, uh, an, uh, accusing them of being anti-Semites or at least allowing anti-Semitism to, to, to take off in the Labour Party, which was smears. Mm. Um, and they then turned around and started writing opinion pieces for them. Whereas I think what you do is you call them out and you say, look, the, the media is misinforming the public. We don't want to be part of that. We want to support independent media. We're going to give interviews to, I don't know, the Canary or or open democracy, or whatever it is. Why? Well, why? Bluff did that, you know, back in um, the 1980s, I think it was, late 70s, when he was manager of Nottingham Forest, our local rivals. He was the Derby County manager, and all Nottingham Forest success, by the way, was achieved with our manager. Just get that on the record. Um, <laughs> but when uh, T. Bailey Foreman um, created a dispute with the, uh, with the journalists at the Nottingham Post, they then created an alternative newspaper, Nottingham News, and they were sustained actually, for about 18, a year of 18 months or so. It was weekly because Brian refused to speak to the Nottingham Post. And Nottingham Forest were like, you know, one of the best teams in the country at the time, twice European champions. And he would only speak to the Nottingham News. And that really, you know, obviously lots of people wanted it locally and Nottingham wanted to read about the, the local uh, team and so on and uh, and get, the, you know, the, the inside track from, from Brian Clough. Mm. Uh, he gave a, a wonderful example of, of what should be done, and uh, but, but you know, not enough people step up to the plate. No. And I think there's, a, there's a block. I think it may change. I think that how the I think God, Corbyn did reveal the media. That was one, even though it, effectively it failed as a project after four years. I think it changed many people's society wide their view of the media because people had to they they like 
giving the pretense that they're fair and and it's it's adversarial to everyone and we're not we're not biased and we're not we're not polit- party political but you saw uh, Corbyn they all took the gloves off and they all came out of the shadow they did not care about making completely obvious that they were running a complete uh, 24/7 campaign to destroy mm-hmm. him and to destroy his project so i think that awareness it makes it an opportunity and this is including the guardian in fact especially the guardian so this is an opportune moment to uh, with with that awareness, which has been heightened by the Corbyn project, to to build something better, and it's it is a long term project, of course, but it has to be done. And mm-hmm. I, I think what your point as well, uh, it, it goes with how the how Liverpool treated treat the Sun after what they did. Oh were, yes, fantastic, wonderful. Yeah. Example. Yeah. 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 So what 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 if if someone spent four years accusing you of allowing anti semitism when you're one of the, uh, the the most important anti racist figures of the past yeah. generation why why would you then give why not boycott them because no, they're, they're spreading lies about you and they're, they're they're generating a completely fake campaign about you that that has damaged your, your reputation and in some ways destroyed your projects so just have nothing to do with them in my opinion yeah i mean and um i'm just conscious because we're running out of time and it's been so fascinating but uh, but your final point and then we'll go to some questions from viewers and we're getting lots and lots of questions coming in um relates to Starmer and his relationship with Murdoch's Times newspaper and um, the links there and meetings that he's had. And I know you've asked some questions about that and I don't suppose you've had any answers to that question either, but could you just expand on that a little bit as well? Sure, so again, this was this was in the register which I looked at um, from his time at the CPS of hospitality. And it just became quite clear that he had a special relationship with the Times. He'd, he'd seen, he'd gone for lunch um, with three times journalists within a space of two months and, and hadn't accepted hospitality from any other newspaper in that, uh, in, I think in the whole time he was there. And he went to the Times uh, Christmas drinks the same year that he saw these three journalists. Um, and again, he was at this stage being presented as a sort of liberal, um, uh, he was a sort of hero to some people as a human rights lawyer. Um why was he developing such a close relationship with with a newspaper that's one owned by Rupert Murdoch and two is extremely is like you said used to do some good work but is is basically now a, a neoconservative propaganda organ um, and in fact another interesting fact which is not known and never written about in the press I think the only person who's ever referenced it in the press is me in an article I wrote about security services and Corbyn but jo- Sir John Scarlett the former head of MI6 joined the board of the Times newspaper in 2010, the year after he left MI6. Mm. So um, you have links with the intelligence services as well. But he, uh, he, I also looked at the journalists that he had gone to lunch with, and one of them um, had written a story uh, during uh, uh, Starmer's time in, the shadow, in Corbyn's shadow cabinet. And it was a really critical story using briefings from anonymous shadow cabinet members saying that Corbyn was out of his depth. He couldn't do the job. This was in 2016. And then Starmer, four four months after that article was published, Starmer resigned during the first coup against Corbyn. So, I mean, all these, the the reason I did it as questions was because they are questions. We don't, we can't say anything happened. We can't say he, we can't say there was any, uh, anything uh, malevolent happened during this meeting with MI5 uh, Director General, we don't know. But the point is, these are questions that need answering because he's a public figure now. Yes. And these are, these are institutions and these are people that we, as you say, are not typical for a Labour leader to be associating with in, 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 his, in, his, uh, in his private Absolutely. life. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, hopefully from tonight and the work that you've been doing and using the new media and social media, citizen journalism, as it were, uh, you know, we can build some pressure behind some of these questions to, because, look, Keir can clarify all this and it may be a perfectly innocent um, uh, explanation. Well, if there is, then you should put it on the public record. If there isn't, it just leaves lots of questions. And there's so many smoking guns, I think, that you've revealed this evening, uh, uh, Matt, in your uh, uh, responses to uh, my uh, questions. But let me just move on now to questions from viewers, if that's okay. The, the first one is from somebody is asking uh, if there are any legal implications, as far as you as far as you are aware, of Kia traveling to the states for secret meetings with the prosecution whilst he was head of the CPS in relation to Julian Assange. No, I don't think so, because effectively he is the attorney. He was the attorney general in the UK, so it was it's not irregular for him to have a meeting with an attorney general in the US. So there's no implications, but. 
as I say, in the context of how the the investigation and the the science case was run, it does it does pose questions because it does seem from the from the from the bits and pieces that we've managed to get out of the CPS, it does seem that they were trying very hard to stop the resolution of that um, case early. They wanted it to go on and on. And then there was, uh, the, I didn't mention, but there was another uh, another thing that was revealed in one of the information requests, which was a CPS lawyer at one point commenting on, a, on an article that said that Sweden might drop the case. This is in 2012. And he, he or she said, don't you dare get cold feet, exclamation mark, about, about the Swedes potentially dropping the case. So there was obviously, first of all, the CPS obviously wanted the Swedes to um, keep up the pressure and keep the case so they could have an excuse to keep Assange uh, in the embassy and before that uh, in confinement. Uh, and then there's also the issue of um, what what Keir's role was in that, because we don't know. And obviously in the context of these visits to Washington, D.C., three of them, that anything could have happened. Um, so these are just questions that needs answering because we're talking about a we're talking about the leader of the Labour Party. We're talking about uh, probably the most important free press issue in modern history. So these are questions that need need answering because at some stage he might have to make uh, policies and make make comments on the Assange case. Yeah. And if none of this context is is known or even even by journalists, then we, we're missing the big elephant in the room. No, indeed. Which takes us on to a, another question from Susie English. She's asking if you could say a bit more about how we can fight the level of corruption that we have in this country today. Any, any thoughts and over and above what you've already said and been doing in terms of what, what can be done, what more people can I, do? I think um, just ignore the, me the mainstream media. I mean, honestly, I, I think that we're, 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 we're bombarded with disinformation and misinformation and got a completely warped view of who the villains are and who the heroes are. As we're seeing with this statue, these statues coming down, there's kind of a realization. In my in my opinion, everyone should um, start getting involved in journalism themselves. I mean, as you talked about citizen journalism before, and I remember you did a, a, a good video yourself when you were an MP about the Integrity Initiative. And that journalism is not rocket science. Anyone can do it. Anyone can ask questions. Anyone can find stuff. All the stuff I found out about Keir Starmer that hasn't been written about by anyone was all online. I just, I just looked. So anyone can do this. So unfortunately, because we have a media that doesn't do its job, the, the responsibility comes on us to find out the information ourselves. So I would, I would tell anyone, if you want to know, combat the corruption, try and go to source material. Do not, do not go to material that's already had all these filters applied to it by corporations or establishment journalists, because you're not going to get the truth. I've got a question here. Thanks, Matt, for that. I've got a question here from one of our YouTube uh, viewers this evening saying she'd like to ask Matt, uh, does he believe that Keir Starmer was involved in the attempt to stop Corbyn from being elected as leader and the two attempts to remove him? Well, I know that he was involved in the coup. He's one of the people that, that resigned. But do you have any thoughts on that? Well, as I said, I don't. these were questions, so I don't know. But they, it, it did seem that these the times this one times journalist was using briefings who had had lunch with was using briefings from the shadow cabinet. It might've been him. We don't know, but he'd obviously has a relationship with that. I think just from my personal political opinion, that he probably did. I mean, I think that he's had a, he's a um, very ambitious individual. He's obviously wanted to be leader uh, uh, for a long time. And I think that it showed when he was, he wasn't, he wasn't loyal in the first coup, uh, which some people were. Um, and it would indicate that he he goes where he he goes where he thinks the wind's going. So I would I would imagine when he saw, and I actually think that he's a large part of the reason that Corbyn failed because he was pushing this uh, Romaniac second uh, people's vote thing, which I think even more than the anti-Semitism crisis was the thing that destroyed the Corbyn project because, it, 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 and that was all Starmer. I mean, alongside a lot of other groups and, and individuals, but he was the Brexit secretary, shadow Brexit secretary. So I think, and he was speaking out off script as well. If you remember during that time, a lot, he was completely undermining Corbyn. And I don't know if that was in, uh, intended to, I, I do ask myself this question is, do the people, were the people's vote, people actually about destroying Corbyn or did they really believe in a people's vote? Because it was so obvious that that was going to destroy Corbyn. It would seem that might have been the calculation, but I don't know. But I was, I mean, it's a difficult question to answer because it's speculation, but I definitely don't think he was an ally. And I think, in fact, 
his promotion by Corbyn is kind of another example of why the whole project failed. Because yeah. he was not the kind of individual you should put anywhere near that position once, let alone twice, when he's already shown that he's he's going to quit on you. So it's this kind of embrace your enemy. I think was the um, the paucity of decent um, parliamentarians in the parliamentary Labour Party, and one of the reasons why I was pressing so hard to democratise the Labour Party and make MPs accountable was to try and raise the calibre so that the people that stand for Parliament are actually more in tune with party members and you know, people that actually support the party as well. And uh, regrettably, in my experience, uh, I think the overwhelming majority, 90 odd percent, and it is as high as that, of the Labour MPs are totally out of touch, totally mm. out of touch with, uh, with the, the membership and totally out of touch in reality with the lives of working class people, mm. with the aspirations on priorities of uh, the overwhelming majority of Labour supporters as well. And uh, it's interesting, just a comment here from uh, uh, Becky uh, matthews Massey. she's saying uh, if, um, well, she's saying that Starmer's more establishment than Johnson, she thinks, and that uh, if he becomes the prime minister, a very British coup will be compl uh, complete. I don't know if you ever read that Chris Mullen book or saw the screenplay in the 1980s. Uh, a very British coup. It's well worth a watch. I think it's available on uh, YouTube if people haven't uh, seen it. Um, but uh, just uh, moving on, and we're running out of time, I'll just try and get a, a couple of uh, further questions in if I can. From Candy Gregory here, she's saying, do you think the leaked Labour report will be swept under the carpet? It looks like it, doesn't it? I mean, again, that's, that's another one of those things we've been talking about, which is you would imagine a, a media that was obsessed with Labour's anti-Semitism crisis for four years, you would think that they would cover this report, which basically exposed uh, a lot of the people that were pushing it were were involved in delaying cases and 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 of really serious offenders like Holocaust deniers, etc. So, mm. I mean, I don't hold out much hope because they do not promote information that does not fit their narratives. That is the rule. If it if it if if it, if it's useful to the establishment narrative, it will be promoted to kingdom come if, if it doesn't it will be completely repressed mm. and labor leaks is an example of some it it completely undermines the narrative which they constructed for four years so of course they're not going to they're going to ignore it they and they can now because because everyone's got a bit bored of it and 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 it doesn't serve any use now i mean it, it's it's done its job it's destroyed corbyn bang ne next please sort of thing you know i mean i i i, I used to think that the anti-semitism crisis would end the day that Corbyn left, yeah. but it hasn't quite happened like that. But I now think that it will, it will, it will carry on until every last remnant well, my, of that's my activism I, is gone. I, I, you know, we, we, we're launched, we have already launched a left legal fighting fund and we will be relaunching it to try and raise some additional uh, funds to, to fight this and the wider smear campaign that's going on in the uh, country. But um, uh, at least half a dozen as the lockdown was imposed, had received letters from the party suspending them for saying nice things about me, believe it or not. I mean, yeah. it's, it's absurd. And there's a, just a couple of quick points. I was one from uh, um, Faraz Khan is asking, how are MP candidates chosen? Why are shallow careerist people always selected? Well, I mean, I'll quickly respond to that. It's basically a stitch up. Um, you know, <laughs> people are imposed from the top. Very often, local members don't get any say. And where they are given a say, good local candidates and other good candidates are kept off the shortlist. Uh, and that's how they ensure that they, you know, we get the, well, the terrible state of affairs that is the, uh, the situation in the parliamentary Labour Party uh, now. And then this is what we will have to be. We're, we're sort of right up against the, the clock now. But um, uh, somebody's asking, uh, Shamsha is asking, why is Piers Morgan seem to have done such a turnaround, in your opinion, uh, Matt, in being critical of the government's response to COVID-19? That is a bit curious, isn't it? What, what, <laughs> <laughs> I can't really get my head around it. I mean, I will remind people that during the war in Iraq, when he was editor of the Daily oh, Mirror, yeah. it was honest, it was the most, uh, it was the best newspaper I've ever seen in the Western world. It was every day it ran a really strong campaign to stop the war with they had John Pilger on the front page uh, yeah. once a week sort of thing so he's obviously got something inside him which is yeah. which takes journalism seriously I mean he's not politically an ally no. but he's uh, you, in, in some ways you don't have to be the journalism I'm talking about is not 
isn't you don't have to be a socialist or on the left. It's just about seeing power as an adversarial thing. Doing, doing your job as a journalist. Exactly. Yes. Questioning, yeah. questioning the narrative yeah. that you're presented with, understanding that politicians lie, whether they're, whether they're on the left, the centre or the right. You know, so I think that he's got a little bit of that adversarial and he, and he, thing in his in his belly. So I think that's probably what it comes down to. I don't. I mean, he's done a really good job, but again, why is he? He's become a celebrity even more than he was because he's doing his job, as you say. This should be everyone should be doing this. No, the fact exactly. that he's celebrated for what he's doing is a real uh, testament to the fact that our media is just awful and does not do its job. Thank you so much. That was an incredibly fascinating uh, hour, which has just flown by. And we've got so many more questions that people wanted to ask. And we always have this problem. And I always give the apology, the standard apology at the end. I'm really sorry that we haven't been able to ask everybody's uh, question. But I'm sure everybody watching will agree that this has been a really interesting uh, episode of uh, Resistance TV. And thank you so much, Matt, for taking the time to, to speak with us this evening. Uh, anybody that's uh, not been able to uh, see the whole broadcast this evening will be able to uh, watch it on YouTube. And uh, anybody who is watching, if you could uh, check out the YouTube link and, and share it around, because link there are so many really important issues that Matt has raised this evening that, that merit a much, much wider audience than the audience that we've had this evening. And I'm, I'm told from the technicians behind the scenes that we've had uh, a, a, a very, very big interest in, in tonight's broadcast. So thank you to everyone for watching.